Today we're looking at uh, tonal values in the form of a light and dark pattern used in this landscape to represent the Rio Grande in New Mexico. And the photo is not excellent, but you can see all the elements we need to make a good painting, shadows, brights, and a nice big mid-tone. As I'm starting the painting, I'm thinking about placing the lighter values. That includes the river, that includes the sky, that includes uh, the tops of the cottonwood trees. I'm doing it without any drawing. I'm finding that I like this method of applying the, <clears throat> the shapes with, with a big brush. I find it gives me accuracy and a greater sense of freedom uh, when I'm composing and when I'm um, designing shapes. You see I'm now using a, a cad yellow uh, to create the, the cottonwoods in the distance, the cottonwoods in the foreground, a feeling of the river, and I'll, I'll continue to add uh, a few of these cottonwoods where I think they'll be effective. <clears throat> uh, paying attention to, of course, increase the size as they get closer. My focal point is going to be where the river's turning up there with one bright cottonwood in the shadows and some bright river in the foreground. And I'm going to be using tonal values or lights and darks to make this more obvious. Uh, perhaps very obvious in this painting to the point where it's maybe too much so, but um, that's the point of this exercise is to find a way to structure our lights and darks, whatever color they be, so that we get a feeling of uh, low light falling across the tops of the cottonwoods. You can see I'm adding a bit of blue into the river uh, while it's wet so that I can get sort of a graded feel to the water, making it feel like it's coming closer and uh, giving me that uh, distinct shape of this winding river moving towards the back and in the landscape. While I'm at it, I'm going to place the light value of the sky, uh, starting with a bit of yellow ochre and a simple application to get a feeling of some clouds, but mostly uh, a transition from a little darker blue to a little lighter blue along the from left to right. Now I'm starting with what I would call the mid-tone of this painting. The mid-tone is the largest tone. It takes up the most real estate in, in any one painting and the artist as they're looking at their subject tries to determine not only the shapes that embody this mid-tone but also is it a light mid-tone? Is it a dark mid-tone? This helps to set the mood of the painting very much. And in uh, this painting where we have a strong backlight, the mid-tone is actually quite dark. And uh, that brings an added drama to the scene. So I'm adding uh, the mid-tone and I'm taking care to change it as I bring it down the painting. Uh, towards the back there's a little more blue as I come lower in the painting and add the mid-tone to the ground in the foreground. I'm using more burnt sienna, maybe a little cad orange to warm it up and make it feel brighter. As I'm applying these brush strokes I'm careful to avoid the large areas of the cottonwoods. I know that I'm going to refine them later but I want to keep the yellow, the bright yellow, as pure as I can for a while. Here you can see this um, mid-tone that's moving through the painting has a nice change to it. It's going from that cooler uh, tone in the back to a much warmer feeling in the front. This helps to create depth, also just helps to make the wash more interesting, more enjoyable visually. Refining it a little bit, maybe placing some darks into this area while it's still a little wet. We have, with watercolor, uh, we have some chances to take advantage of uh, the wet aspect of the paper. And uh, the watercolorist 
has to work with that. Uh, there are things we can do when it's wet and we lose the opportunity if we let it dry. So uh, a sense of timing and uh, working in manageable areas really helps to ensure that you take advantage of, of the media in this way. So I'm, I'm uh, extending it uh, over to the right-hand side now. On the right-hand side, there's a notable shift to a darker aspect, especially as it approaches these lower cottonwoods that I'm working around right now. Um, it gets quite dark, in fact, as, uh, as it descends down a slope that's away from the light. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm building up some detail, but uh, really working hard to make sure that this transform this this tone, which started as a with a little bit of extra blue on top, now is getting warmer uh, with burnt sienna and a little bit of alizarin crimson, especially as it comes close to those cottonwoods um, and close to the riverbank. Now what I'm doing is I'm starting to shape these cottonwoods that are in the foreground, putting some dry brush of the, um, the same color into the cottonwood so that I get this sort of um, backlit effect, sort of a silver lining effect that you notice when the light is very strong and behind your object as it was uh, on this scene. And I'll continue to do that all the way down. I'll be placing some of these darks, which are basically a mixture of uh, cadmium, I'm sorry, cobalt blue, and a bit of neutral tint, and a bit of alizarin crimson, maybe some burnt sienna, maybe some leftovers. Color-wise, I, I would ask you not to think about the color as much as the light and dark aspect. We can only get dark with uh, some of the darker hues on our palette. Ultramarine blue, others are in crimson, neutral tint. These are darks that can give us a, a real strong dark in our painting. We can't go that dark with a yellow ochre, with a with a cadmium yellow, with cadmium orange. These hues just aren't capable of going dark unless we add another pigment, another hue to them. So here I'm developing um, that same sort of effect of a backlight. I'm placing shadows into the cottonwoods now, small shadows, trying to preserve a bit of that original light color. Here we see some shadows which are cast onto the Rio Grande. These shadows will become a, a major part of the painting, giving us a real feeling for the direction of the light, the intensity of the light as they move uh, across the river, as they move from under some of the trees in the background. Also visually, they serve as a means to connect the darks. So this dark that's flowing down the slope on the upper right hand of the painting, in essence, is moving through the cottonwood through the shadows, and it's going to finish uh, in the lower left-hand corner so that there's a strong feeling of unity uh, with the shadows. And uh, in any sort of painting, when we have a chance to connect lights or darks, darks in this case, it makes the painting uh, have a certain integrity, a certain strength. If, there, if the darks or lights are left by themselves kind of floating in the painting, it always creates a bit of a weakness in the composition. So that's why I'm using the same tone, the same rich dark to create these shadows. And we're starting to get a more pronounced feeling of light as we do that with that strong dark, isolating it against some of the lights. Eventually, in this painting, I want there to be more gravity towards the area that I'm working on now, where we have a small cottonwood enveloped by dark shadows. So I will adjust the lights that remain on these cottonwoods, muting them with a bit of uh, yellow or burnt sienna, thus gaining more interest, more impact in that distant 
turn in the in the river. Continuing to add shadows via darks, working with some dry brush now up above, a little bit of a lighter mixture, uh, to continue this idea of darks and a strong light, even up through the back of the painting, even into the distant hills where the, the shadows and the darks are gonna be a little less dramatic but we want there to be consistency so and we see that when we look at nature we see hints of this even in the back far back of the painting we see some small darks um, showing us the same sort of direction of light showing us um, a texture to the landscape and that's how i'm using it now with some dry brush just to give a little texture to that mid-ground now it's uh, I'm adjusting the cottonwoods to work more with my intended center of interest. I'm putting some rich darks in the foreground, again connecting the darks and making those brighter areas uh, more brilliant. Um, refining the cottonwoods so that they have a bit more softness and a bit less edginess. I do that with a dry brush, uh, kind of scumbling it onto the, to the paper. At this stage, though, I would say the painting is giving us a finished feel. And I'm, what I mean by that is we can see the end. We can see um, what, if anything, needs to be done. It's uh, smaller adjustments at this point, some softening of the edges, some um, smaller darks added for effect and uh, those when you can when you can see the sort of finished state in your painting those become more obvious and you feel confident in placing them and that's what I'm doing now you I don't know if you can tell well from this video but I'm adding mm, some yellows and some in tandem with some darks to refine the shapes of the cottonwoods and the shadows that they're casting. A little tone to the rock that's in the foreground. Um, we could extend this painting with adding some more lights if we wanted, but I think this is for the exercise, for the presentation of a what I would call a tonal value pattern of um, a small light in a mid-sized dark surrounded by a dark mid-tone. Uh, this is a pretty good representation. That small light being in the upper third of the painting with that large cottonwood surrounded by a large dark area around it, which extends into the shadows, and then an overall mid-tone, which is quite dark.